So welcome all. Uh, today we begin part three of our series on the psychic being after leaving the body. And Vladimir will open uh, this six part series, exploring the topic, death and its place in integral yoga. Vladimir says that the most profound topic of our life worth pondering upon is death. We are constantly dying and by dying we are born again. Death is a perpetual way of life in time and space of the immortal spirit. Otherwise, it could not sustain in time and space in this physical form. The form is imperfect, therefore it must be rebuilt, and the spirit must be born again in a new form. To let go of that which has no future is the wisdom of life, he says. Death is like a quality control over the progress made by the spirit in the imperfect form towards immortality for it does not permit any imperfect form to endure. It is a power that removes all worked out materials, cleansing space and time from outdated forms by reforging them into new forms. Therefore, he says, the universe is always new and fresh as it were. So along these lines, Vladimir will explore the phenomenal of death in the light of integral yoga. Dr. Vladimir Yatsenko is the Director of the Institute for Applied Research and Integral Studies here at the Lagrasse Urbindo Integral Life Center in Fountain Inn, South Carolina. He holds a master's degree in linguistics and in Sanskrit language and literature and a PhD in Indian philosophy. Vladimir is an instructor of Sanskrit and an educator and researcher in Vedic and Vedantic studies. Here at the center, Vladimir conducts courses in the Rig Veda, the Upanishads, and Sanskrit. We have also joining us today, H.P. Uh, Rama. Welcome, H.P. Uh, okay. um, so nice that you can join us on this kickoff uh, series that will take us pretty much through mid-December. Um, before handing it over to Vladimir, I just want to remind everyone that uh, is joining us from India that uh, tonight our time changes in the U.S. So we will continue uh, here in the U.S. to stay to our 10 o'clock uh, New Perspectives time on Saturdays, but this will be uh, 8.30 at night in India starting next week. So just a reminder for all, and please post any questions that you have for Vladimir in the Q&A box as we go. So Vladimir, I'd like to go ahead and hand it over to you. Thank you, Radha. So today we open this profound topic of death and its role and its place in integral yoga. <clears throat> um, we are all pondering about this and thinking about this. What is dying and what is really enduring the death? We can find this in the literature. Nachiketas has the same question to Yama. You know, some think that it is dying. Others say it is enduring. So what is that which endures and what is that which dies? And um, uh, Mother says, interestingly, that dying is like entering another room. So you change your location, so to say. But because she was aware of her own inner being so much that for her it looked like that. Uh, for others, in many traditions, it looks like crossing the river or crossing the field, going to another shore. And, um, and it is quite a challenging um, passage because there are vital forces around which are trying to rob the soul of its, you know, uh, powers and especially energies. And uh, Mother built the whole tunnel, as she says, tunnel for the souls to pass um, safely to another shore. Uh, and she says, from now on, the souls will be safe from these attacks of the vital forces in this passage. Many know also sadhaks of uh, integral yoga, uh, ashramites and our villains, they know how she describes the uh, vision of the sadhaks passing uh, and uh, leaving the body. And uh, she describes them having the sign of Sri Aurobindo on their forehead. It is his 
protection or his mercy, as it were, his grace given to the sadhaks. Yeah? So, um, it is um, these topics which are very fascinating and um, uh, attracts our attention. So, Shubhind also compares uh, death to our sleep state. He says that uh, basically we, uh, every day we go to sleep, it is something similar. We are kind of preparing ourselves to go to another uh, dimension of life where the outer circumstances and connections do not have the place anymore. Um, there is a difference between sleep and death. There is a difference between death and exteriorization and, uh, um, and so on. Because when the death takes place, then it's a physical uh, consequences of life between cells is disturbed and the body is dropped, the physical body is dropped and all the surface relations of this physical body with surface mind, vital and even subtle physical are also dropped into the universal mind, universal vital and universal physical, or as Shurabindo calls them subliminal mind, vital and physical. But something endures of them, and these are the centers of the self which are built around psychic being. The mental self, the vital self, and even the physical self elements, the subtle physical in this case, um, enduring and causing what we know in the next reincarnation, karma, as Sri says. So karma is caused by those elements which survived uh, around the, our innermost center. So I would I prepared the PowerPoint presentation and would like to project it uh, to give some overview of how it is um, approached in integral yoga. So. I would like to start with uh, part one. So I have three parts of my presentation. I would love to cover some of it, maybe part one and two, and um, and then open to questions and answers. I would like to have a dialogue with you. So the justification of death, Shirobindo speaks. The nature of physical life imposes death because all life exists by a mutual devouring and struggle, and life itself feeds upon the forms it creates. It's a well-known passage also in the Taitiriya, yes? Ahaman naman namadan tamadmi. I am the food or the matter which eats the eater of food. So this is how it is built. The oneness is maintained through this constant regeneration or recapturing um, the new form by the same energy. So it devours its own previous form and builds another form on the pawn, upon that form. But the fundamental justification, says Sri Aurobindo, of death is the necessity of a constant variation of experience in succession of time. The soul seeking thus to enlarge itself and move towards the realization of its own infinity. So the fundamental justification is within the soul and its experience and its need for the infinite varieties of experiences in succession of time. So you can imagine if there would be no change of form and everybody would be stuck to a particular form, the soul will be robbed of these infinite varieties of its own, you know, need of its own realizations. So that's the major justification of death. 
On the cause of death, Sri Aurobindo says also interestingly, most people die before the vitality of the body is exhausted. Uh, the vitality of the body, it's an interesting topic. We think that we die because the body does not have any more power to live. You know, uh, we speak about this in Ayurveda, that we have a kind of a force, orgas, given to us for life time, which when it's, it is spent, the body dies. But usually we never die uh, at the end of the expenditure of this uh, orgies. We die before, we have still vitality to continue to live. It is due to many causes, says Sri Aurobindo, of which one is the destiny prepared by past lives, another the inner purpose or utility of the present life being completed. So the soul is the uh, is the deciding um, uh, factor because once the present life uh, the purpose and the utility of the present life was completed and the soul may decide to leave the body which is still capable of living but these are subtle and secret reasons says Sri Aurobindo others accident violence or other causes are only an exterior machinery. So they are not the real cause. They are just the means by which the soul is deciding to live. And that reminds me of the story of Krishna, as you remember, when he was caused, cursed by Gandhari, when she saw all of her sons killed in the Kurukshetra battle. She curses Krishna that he will die. He will be killed by his own people. And they came to him and rushed to him and said, look what Gandhari did, she cursed you. And he says, she speaks with my voice. So it was his choice to go. So. The curse was the choice of Krishna. He chose that path to leave the body. It's very interesting anyway. Um, we have to look into the profound vision of our evolution to understand the cause of death. Shubindra says this terrestrial evolutionary working of nature has a double process. There is an outward visible process of physical evolution with birth as its machinery, birth and death. Yes? For each evolved form of body housing its own evolved power of consciousness is maintained and kept in continuity by heredity. So we have children, children have children, and we leave our body and children continue the evolution in that body. There is at the same time an invisible process of soul evolution with rebirth into ascending grace of form and consciousness as its machinery. And this is what endures. So actually, if you look at this, we can see that both endure. The physical evolution endures through heredity, through our children, whereas the soul is enduring anyhow. Through reincarnations it comes, learns and goes again. So the death is actually the, the way of enduring in time in different bodies of the soul evolution. So there is a, the whole discussion, dispute, which mother gives in the agenda on what is death. Death, she says the mother, is the decentralization of the consciousness contained in the body's cells. Many of you know that mother was doing the um, yoga of cells, yes? and um, of the body, of the physical body. So 
she was very interested of what is really death and how it takes place. So she arrived at this vision or this knowledge that the death is the de decentralization of the consciousness contained in the body's cells. So there's something which holds body cells together as one entity, some consciousness, some power, some concentration, and this body functions. This is from the point of view of the body, not from the point of view of the soul. Um, with the whole world of perception at the same time, so these body cells are held together not only in the body separate from the world, but the whole surrounding consciousness is held together with this body. Mother makes a gesture around her, like a general terrestrial consciousness. It is interwoven into all relations on earth with examples showing that it's only when the consciousness contained in the cells is decentralized that one is dead. So when the, this decentralization is taking place, then all that which we build around ourselves, all the relations with other beings, uh, people, uh, stories, dogmas, religions, uh, culture, language, everything falls apart. So it is held with this consciousness holding the body cells together as one entity, as the Purusha, as the person. Otherwise, nothing, she says, not even the heart stopping can cause death. So it's not a mechanical kind of mis malfunctioning of the body which makes death possible. It is this decentralization of the consciousness contained in the body's cells. Naturally, this decentralization stems from innumerable causes. So what can cause it is not really the cells, but they are causes we might call psychological. This is exactly where the soul decides, where enough is enough and it leaves, even a healthy body, even body which can still continue to live. And otherwise, and the body which is not capable to live can be uh, still living, yeah? in the state of coma, in the state of trance, but because the soul is not leaving it, it will continue to live, though it is not capable to fully function. So, and the cells contained in the body or composing the body are held in form by centralization of the consciousness in them. There's some centralization of consciousness in the cells. And as long as that power of concentration is there, the body cannot die. It's only when the power of concentration disappears that the cells scatter and then the body dies. The habitual centralization, a centration, concentration, sorry, the habitual concentration of nature produced by nature is a mechanical concentration. You see, it's highlighted, mechanical concentration, which is subject to all sorts of mechanical laws, physical laws. But Mother reads out her note, which she wrote in the night in her meditation. Here is what came. The very first step towards immortality is to prepare the mechanical centralization by a willed centralization, to replace the mechanical centralization by a willed centralization, which comes from the inner presence, which means that through its will, the divine presence concentrates the cells. 
So the divine presence has to take charge of the body directly, not through the mechanical means of nature. Now, even we, when we speak about mechanical means of holding the oneness of the body, it is still that evolutionary achievement of the spirit, which was translated into capacity of nature to hold it even mechanically. But now it is not enough. It has to be a direct interference of the higher consciousness or the presence in the body. And that would be the, the cause of immortality. Sri speaks about uh, death as the means of journey of life. It's quite interesting to look at this. In a general way, a life is only one brief episode in a long history of spiritual evolution in which the soul follows the curve of the line set for the earth, passing through many lives to complete it. So it's like a long passage of many lives for the soul. It is an evolution out of material in conscience to consciousness and on towards uh, the divine consciousness, from ignorance to divine knowledge, from darkness through half-lights to light, from death to immortality, from suffering to divine bliss. Suffering is due first to the ignorance, secondly to the separation of the individual consciousness from the divine consciousness and being a separation created by the ignorance. When that ceases, that separation ceases, when one lives completely in the divine and no more in one's own separated smallest self, then only suffering can altogether cease. Interestingly, this uh, there are many, many, many uh, thoughts coming with this statement, but one of the interesting um, the mantras we know from Brihadaranyaka is actually um, kind of repeating the same vision of Sri Aurobindo. Asato ma sad gamaya, tamaso ma jyotir gamaya, mrityor ma mritam gamaya. Lead me from non-being to being, lead me from darkness to light, lead me from death to immortality. If we analyze this mantra even linguistically, we will see that there is someone to be led by someone who leads. And non-being and being are the locations. Lead me from one room to another, from non-being to being. Lead me from darkness to light, from one room to another. Lead me from death, from the process of constantly changing my form in time and space, to immortality, where this change will not be needed. What is important here, what Sri says, that they and the mother, that the charge of the body is to be taken by the inner presence, by the divine presence in us, is actually inbuilt in the stages of integral yoga. And this is the passage I took from the conversations with Pavitra in his meditation, you know, guidance to meditation. It is the first day when Sri spoke to him about his integral yoga in 1925. And what he said is this, there is in us a region which is above space and time, immobile, immutable at first. It does not participate in the waves of emotions and thoughts. The first step of this yoga is to center one's consciousness in this region and keep it there. This is mukti. 
So we have to separate Purusha from Prakriti. In us, beyond our personality, the Purusha is seen, with many attributes which are successfully unveiled. They are not yet unveiled, but they will be. First of all, he appears as the witness of actions and sensations, untouched, unalterable. This is the, the experience of nirvanic you know, experience of, of separation when Shubindo describes that he saw himself like in the movie, the same as other beings. He was not himself in that movie. Then he manifests as the giver of sanctions. He approves or refuses his consent to a movement of prakriti desire or thought or even action when such an order is given the sanction is given by purusha to prakriti's movement as for instance the refusal to take part in a certain emotion though the past is yet strong the being turns away from that emotion so purusha can regulate our thoughts, emotions, actions with his conscience, conscious interference or sanction. He becomes Anumanta. Before he was Sakshi, the witness, now he is Anumanta, the one who gives sanctions. Then Purusha is the knower. And in him is the knowledge. This knowledge has several forms. The lowest is intuition. Intuition is really the lowest form of knowledge of Purusha. Then comes the knowledge in unity. In any case, the senses are no longer avenues of knowledge. It comes directly from Purusha. And finally, Purusha reveals himself as Ishvara, the Lord, governing and acting through his instruments. He, at last, takes his kingdom in his hands. This is a full possession of the spirit of his nature, of the body. Then there will be no death. So you could see in these stages uh, of integral yoga the movement from death to immortality. That's why I put it here. Um, is there are other interesting topics, um, how to prepare oneself for a peaceful death. Death is not at all what you believe it to be, says Sri Aurobindo. You expect from death the neutral quietness of an unconscious rest, but to obtain that rest, you must prepare for it. When you die, you lose only your body, and at the same time, the possibilities of relation with and action on the material world. It's not only that you die and the, the same uh, surrounding will stay. It will disappear like in the dream. But all that belongs to the vital world, does not disappear all your emotions, all your sensations, with the material substance. Material substance goes and vitality, desires stay. All your desires, attachments, cravings persist with a sense of frustration and disappointment. And all that prevents you from finding the expected peace. To enjoy a peaceful and eventless death, you must prepare for it. We must work for it. And the only effective preparation is the abolition of desires. Quite amazing. We mentioned this in our opening of this series. You remember when we took birth first time. And that's what Mother said, and Gita confirms, and all religions confirm this. And we will hear more in this series uh, on death 
about this uh, preparation for the next incarnation. Besides, says Mother, during its previous incarnation, going before going away, before leaving the Earth atmosphere, usually as a result of the experience it had in the life that is coming to an end, the soul chooses more or less, not in all details, but broadly, the conditions of its future life. That's why the last moment of life is so important. In many religions they speak about these confessions before leaving the body, to leave all the heaviness behind and move forward, to make a projection for a new reincarnation. In the Gita it is also said in the chapter 8, Yam Yam Vapi Smaram Bhavam Tyajat Yante Kalevaram Tam Tam so, whatever the bhava, whatever the state of consciousness one thinks of in the moment of leaving the body, he goes to that bhava, supported by that um, uh, concentration. Uh, it's quite important for us to know this to prepare oneself for departure. Sri Bindu speaks about our journey after death. What happens, actually? Here there are several passages which explain this journey after we depart from the body. There is after death, a period in which one passes through the vital world and lives there for a time. So we come to the vital worlds of desires, sensations, uh, uh, feelings, emotions, all that we wanted, we didn't have, didn't realize, we will face all those energies. It is only the first part of this transit that can be dangerous or painful. In the rest, one works out, under certain surroundings, a remnant of the vital desires and instincts which one had in the body. As soon as one is tired of these and able to go beyond, the vital sheath is dropped. And the soul, after a little time, needed to get rid of some mental survivals, <laughs> mental survivals are those ideas, dogmas, and so on, passes into a state of rest in the psychic world and remains there till the next life on earth. So we are all going to that mm, psychic world where we rest and prepare for the next incarnation. One can help the departed soul but by one's good will or by occult means if one has the knowledge. We will speak about the Tibetan book of the dead. That is the occult means which may help the soul to travel. The one thing that one should not do is to hold them back by sorrow for them or longing or anything else that would pull them near to earth or delay their journey to their place of rest. That's why we have these rituals, departure rituals, where we are saying farewell to the soul. We give them freedom from us, we free them from us and wish them the best in their journey. It may happen to some not to realize for a little time that they are dead, especially if the death has been unforeseen and sudden. But it cannot be said that it happens to all or to most some may enter into a state of semi-unconsciousness or obsession by a dark inner condition created by their state of mind at death, in which they realize nothing of where they are 
etc. Others are quite conscious of the passage. So there is a very um, specific way of dying when the person is not expecting death totally, so it happens suddenly, and so that state of mind or that condition in which he stayed may haunt him for a while, and so he will not be aware that he is dead. It is true that the departing being in the vital body lingers for some time near the body or the scene of life, very often for as many as eight days, says Sri Aurobindo. And in the ancient religions, mantras and other means were used for the severance, for the separation. Even after the severance from the body, a very earthbound nature or one full of strong physical desires, one of strong physical desires may linger long in the earth atmosphere up to a maximum period extended to three years. Up to three years the soul, the shadow of the soul can be here around the the physical conditions of life. Afterwards, it passes to the vital worlds, proceeding on its journey, which must sooner or later bring it to the psychic rest till the next life. It is inevitable. It is true also that sorrow and mourning for the dead impedes its progress by keeping it tight to the earth atmosphere and pulling it back from its passage. So we have to be careful not to wish or not to remember often those who passed. We have to let them go. So what is actually being severed? What is really dying? What is separating from the rest and how it takes place? I took this um, um, diagram of our being and we can see that uh, this ego uh, which is um, holding together our outer mind, outer vital and outer physical. That's where we live usually in our surface being, surface consciousness. There is also the support of the inner mind, inner vital and inner physical and even subconscious, which is uh, already subliminal as you see. So it belongs to the universal nature which supports our surface personality. So when we die, so this, this um, outer mind, outer vital and physical are being dissolved, resolved, yes? With physicality, we drop our outer vital and outer mental relations related to our circumstances of life. Hmm? But the inner movements of our being remain. Yes, these outer relations they are dropped into the um, into subliminal, into the universal domains of mind, vital, and physical and subconscious. But what remains is the psychic entity and the elements of the mind, vital, and physical, which were built around the psychic entity, which represent our true self, Manomaya Purusha. Prana Maya Purusha and Anna Maya Purusha even in the subtle form, subtle physical, still remain and will be the cause of the next reincarnation, which we call karma, or that which is karmic presupposition, which will predefine our um, our ways how we will be dealing in the reincarnations with ourselves and others. Um, here I'm coming to the end of my uh, part one presentation. So if you look at the other scheme, how the Veda looked at this, the triple worlds of the Veda, and uh, we will see here the mental, triple mental, triple vital, triple physical, uh, centers of our being. 
So when we die, according to the Vedic vision and according to the occultism, uh, which mother brought, actually it is the language of the mother she brought into the integral yoga, and I'm using it for mapping it with the Vedic vision. So what we drop, we drop our, these uh, lower physical, you know, so physical, physical, vital, physical, and mental, physical are dissolved. Interestingly, that mental, physical, this mental, physical, the top, you know, here on the physical, is that what mother was dealing in her yoga of the cells. It is the mentality, the mind of cells. There are several books on this. The mind of cells is that which holds the being together. So this will be dropped. This is what is dissolving, as Mother says. Mental, physical will let go the cells. So there will be no one entity anymore. So, but it is severed or it is caused by something which is in the vital world, vital, vital, is that navel or that thread. Uh, which connects our vital body and through it our soul to the physical body. It is there the disconnection, this yellow, this orange color here, vital, vital. There the disconnection takes place. And so by dropping physical, we must also disconnect the physical vital. This will be the, the part dissolved and then the soul is free to go to the mental vital and to deal with the universal vital and to the mental worlds. In the theosophical vision and occultistic vision, it was believed that the soul was this mental monada, as they call it, the mental formation. But in the in our vision, we do not identify mental self as the soul. We know that it is only a part of the mind which endured because it was centered around the psychic being. And psychic being is the soul which is different from Manomaya Purusha. This is uh, the, uh, the material which I wanted to share with you in my part one. In part two, I would want I would like to look into the Vedic traditions, how it was looked into how different um, uh, these elements of the integral yoga are um, um, seen or could be traced in the Vedic and post-Vedic literature. Uh, but most probably I should stop here for now and um, open to questions or some discussions. And if you have time more, I would take part two. If not, it will be available for you in this format, so you can read it for yourself and think for yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Vladimir. That was um, very enlightening and, and many things there that uh, was new and uh, things I hadn't uh, realized. So we really, uh, really appreciate that in-depth discussion. And just before taking any questions, um, I wanted to introduce uh, Robin Blanchard uh, joined us um, as part of the panel. And Robin will be speaking as part of this series on November 18th on the Tibetan's Book of the Dead that uh, Vladimir had uh, referenced. So we just wanted to also uh, uh, welcome Robin uh, to the panel. And if people have uh, questions, please do answer, but uh, perhaps I can um, ask one uh, first, Vladimir, uh, as questions are coming in. Um, you had mentioned that uh, there are subtle or secret reasons for the soul to decide to leave the body and that these outer accidents and other mechanisms are just that. They're, they are just, uh, uh, they, are, they are mechanisms and not the real reason uh, that the soul has, has left. Um, question for you is, uh, did the mother uh, speak or address the uh, subtle or secret reasons for Sri Aurobindo deciding to leave his body? And if so, if that's something you could share with us. Right. Thank you for this question. It's kind of very important for us, for sadhaks of integral yoga. 
because nobody expected Sri Aurobindo to leave his body. Nobody thought that it would be even possible to, for him to leave his body. Everybody expected him to stay forever. He was, uh, he was Chiranjeevi. He was the one uh, the, who could uh, choose his departure uh, consciously by himself, so to say. He didn't have to leave the body. He had a particular power of control over his physical body. And then suddenly he left his body on the 5th of December 1950. And mother was shocked uh, because he didn't tell the mother and that it she explained later he didn't tell her because he knew that she would not let him go <laughs> uh, but he had to make this decision because the supramental power which he called upon earth which created already a lot of havoc on earth because the pressure of this supreme light uh, causes the answer from the depth of darkness so the darkness was rising with the pressure of light from above and there was no way to deal with it other than avatar as Sri Aurobindo is the avatar uh, should take it onto himself and dissolve that attack of darkness otherwise uh, the whole evolutionary journey which they intended for us would be delayed for many hundreds of years. So this was the greatest of the sacrifice, Mother says, the greatest, greater than ever whoever created for humanity to take this death onto himself, this darkness onto himself, to allow humanity to progress and evolve faster. This was the cause of death. Thank you. There's a couple of questions there, Vladimir. Would you like me to read them out or would you like to read them? I can read. If okay. one is not to have desires at time of passing, is not the aspiration to join the divine a desire as well? <laughs> right. Well, if you can call it aspiration, yes, aspiration is a bit different from desires, vital desires and cravings, as we know, yes. Aspiration does not have that urgency or that, you know, wanting to realize it right now. The vital desires always has, always has this urgency. And aspiration is in itself satisfied, as it were. So that aspiration may stay, but the cravings and desires should go. This is a big difference between the two. What is the process for those, especially the children who are being slaughtered in Gaza and Israel? This is a difficult question. Yes, those who are slaughtered, those who became the victims of war, in Gaza, Israel, in Ukraine, how many kids are dead and the war is something like opening the you know the box of pandora all the forces join this feast and not only good forces but especially those vital forces rakshasas paishachas and they all possess human beings sometimes and they fall into that trap they are victims, though they think they are victorious, but if they do something like this, kill people, they become, to a certain extent, the victims of these forces. It depends what is leading them in that um, war. Yeah. It's a very complex question. We can come to, you know, to Kurukshetra and start talking about this, why Sri Krishna was um, causing asking Arjun to fight and how Arjuna resisted and why. This is exactly that question, how to fight. If you are fighting on the side of the divine, then uh, it's very different uh, than you fight on the side of the Rakshasas and Paishachas. Hmm. But this is an inner decision and only you can decide for yourself. It's very difficult to say it about others. Spiritual knowledge can only be learned in a physical body. Very beautiful. 
Helen, thank you. I think so. There is no learning, there is no change possible without physical body. It is in the physical body that all spiritual changes take place. That's why we take the body. And because um, otherwise, if we are out of the body, the learning is not taking place. We are just in that slumber world, waiting for the next opportunity to learn and to change and to grow and to evolve. Um, is there an idea of evolving psychic being in Vedic literature? I think so, absolutely. I, I, I think so, I know so even. Because if you analyze the very journey, because the sacrifice, Yajna Madhavaram, uh, yes, the sacrifice, pilgrim sacrifice, is considered to be the movement or the journey. Uh, the man is con considered or even compared, Shubindu even translates as ever advancing pilgrim. Man is ever advancing pilgrim. We are constantly on the way. Um, towards higher and higher realizations. As Shubindu says in the, in Savitri, on the height he stood that looked upon greater heights. So moving from heights to heights, it's a journey. And this journey is a constant battle with the forces that resist, the forces which do not want our uh, advancement. Uh, so, there is a beautiful book by Satpram which is called The Adventure of Consciousness. Yeah? This adventure is exactly the journey. Uh, Shubindu took this idea from the Veda, I believe, and he had in himself already this idea. And he calls uh, man a, a transitional being, the being which is constantly growing in consciousness. We are not the final product of nature. We are in transition. So I believe that Veda was actually nearly the only literature uh, in the Indian um, spirituality which was taking evolution of consciousness um, uh, seriously and build on it. And that is the sacrifice. Sacrifice is a constant transformation of our nature by the spirit. It's ongoing process. It's not the, the something final event, you arrive at the final event. No, you go on transforming it and molding it more and more into the suitable instrument of the spirit. I have a very bad internet connection that would like, but would like to place my question. You mentioned sleep and death. Can I prepare for death in my sleep? Mm. Um, and her second question, and if yes, how? So. <laughs> Sorry well, about that. We had the whole beautiful course on the conscious sleep. Become conscious in your sleep. Yeah? If you are conscious, the, the problem with death and transition, that we become unconscious. We lose our, our awareness. So we do not where we are, what is happening to us, and later we kind of born again and that's it and then we become aware of our uh, state but to be totally aware that means you will have to work through yes build your conscious sleep then you will build your mind which will be aware of things which are subtle in the subliminal worlds you will build your feelings and emotions have control over them will over them bring your a will, awakened will into the sleep and start managing those emotions, sensations, thoughts, uh, movements, forces, energies. And if you start doing it, you will build more and more elements in the mind and the vital which will be centered around your uh, psychic being. Because only psychic being can manage these worlds. Yes? That free power of free will is coming from Purusha. And if you exercise that power of free will in your dream, you build more elements which will endure. 
And so you will prepare yourself uh, for the passage in death. So I think I, these are all the questions. Yes, there are no yeah, more. I just I just had a, a one other uh, question, and if anybody else does, we still have a few minutes. So uh, please type in or, or join us on the panel. I wanted to go back, uh, Vladimir, to um, two different slides. One uh, in which the mother mentioned that uh, the soul will decide, in general, not specific. Uh, about its next life um, before it leaves the earth atmosphere. She references earth atmosphere. And then later uh, you mentioned, I don't know if it was Shri Aurobindo, I think it was Shri Aurobindo who said that it could take up to three years for the soul to pass through the physical and then the vital and then, and then the mental. Um, so does that mean that perhaps during, and then it will leave the earth atmosphere. So does that mean that during that kind of journey through the earth atmosphere, the physical, vital, and mental, that perhaps it is still, um, determining its, uh, its next life? Or do you feel that that happens as soon as the soul leaves the physical body? regardless of this, but up to potentially a three-year journey? I don't know if there's an answer or not, but just a question that Most came to me. Most probably there is no answer to it, but we are all very trained and very experienced in this topic, truly speaking, because all of us who are here in the body, we died and were born many times. So I think this has to be discovered by us. I'm... A mother says that all possibilities are there. One should not exclude any of them. And as long as the connection with the physical world is still there, most probably even certain correlations of the decision of what is to be done in the next life will be made. Absolutely possible, especially if the soul is uh, more powerful in its determination or something. Or, But usually this um, they are stuck. Yeah, that is the description of when the soul is not free to go because of certain um, tie-ups with uh, their relatives or with, uh, with something is not finished, unfinished business. Yeah, and um, and the soul continues to linger and to you know to 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 sit around the this um, life which was lived trying to, to correlate it, or, or not aware of that it is dead. But interestingly, there is a time limit, and this is a very good news for us. That means sooner or later, after three years, soul will be tired of all this and will proceed on its journey to, to this world. The problem with those who are left, who are pulling them, they sometimes may create over years the phantoms of these beings and believe that these beings are still, they see them in dreams, they see them, uh, they, have, they talk to them and they have relations with them. And these phantoms are already far from being that being. You know? There are different vital forces, remnants of those beings, or maybe totally different vital forces, take that form and have relations with you in the name of your beloved or in the name of your relative. So you think you deal with your father or your mother, and it is not so at all. And this can be dangerous and can be, these forces may misuse and abuse your relations with them energetically. So one has to be careful not to linger too long and not to, you know, try to, to connect to those who left their bodies and are free on their journey to the next life. There's one more question. Is there an effective way to release thought patterns or memories of past um, failings, most probably? Yeah? Um, yeah. Oh, as a way to prepare for death. Oh, oh maybe I'm, even absolutely. feelings, thought patterns yeah. or memories or past or feelings, feelings, maybe. Mm. Um, yes, um, of course, uh, that's what we try to do. That's the major thing of our psychological treatment of ourselves, yoga, 
meditation, um, reflection, understanding of what is happening, how we are functioning. It is all that knowledge which purifies us from the wrong movements of in thought and feeling. And finally, knowledge is the most purifying agent for us. As, um, as in the Gita, it is said that there is nothing more purifying than knowledge. So we, that's why we seek knowledge. We want to know what is truth and to be true. We want to be true. So, she had answered that she meant uh, failures. So just FYI, past failures. Yeah, it Thanks, was, Stacey, yeah. for that uh, question. Um, as there is uh, no no other questions, Let then it. we'll go ahead. Let oh, me Let me Yes, HP. Let me. Uh, can you can you share with us uh, how soul decides geographically where it should take a birth? Is it is in India? America or Latin America? I think geographically, soul is not looking at the earth. Yeah? It made an intention and it chooses, for example, geographically, I was born in the Soviet Union. Can you imagine where my father was propagandist of atheism, saying everything, going around and telling people that there is no God. But look where I ended up. I ended up living in India half of my life, <laughs> and then uh, I am in the U.S. in the center. So geographically, it seems it is less important. Maybe it was important before when the traveling was more difficult. Um, it is more suitable conditions for soul development. Yeah. So parents, surrounding, that is important. What you, um, was the genetic, um, strength of parents you, uh, take from your parents, also their consciousness, what they will give you, what you need for your development. That is recognized in a very um, secret and, um, manner, which we do not know how our soul knows where to go, but there is some agent, and I may talk about this, some other time during this uh, series, that there is an agent which helps us to decide where to be born. Now we are talking about reincarnation, not passing, but we decided we want to have that experience. That is what we are looking for in the future life. At the end of our life, there is a clear understanding what is next. And that understanding decides for us uh, where we will be fitting, into what family we will fit. In the ancient India, there was a whole system which was actually supporting the birth of the soul. And that is the ritualistic system. For example, uh, in this family of, uh, um, I, let us say, Brahmins, they recite mantras every day, they do pujas, they do rituals, uh, and so on. And that is the pattern which soul recognizes when it wants to be born. So if the soul wants to be born in the family of Brahmins, to be Brahmin, it uh, recognizes from the subtle world that pattern of energy, and it attracts it to that uh, family. Um, if somebody wants to be, you know, fighting for the truth, to be the king here in the family of um, uh, the king, they will be training in weaponry, in tactics, in politics, and that will generate an energy, specific energy, which will attract the soul. So in the, um, in the Gita, when Krishna dissolves that system, mixes up jatis, as he says in the first chapter, uh, Arjuna asks, you are mixing varnas. Varna Sanskara, why do you, when you mix them, how would we know who is who? Where would soul go to its place where it could really take that what it wants, what it needs for its development? Now, it won't be cognizable. That's, that's his major argument to Krishna. And Krishna answers a very interesting manner later. He says, now everyone, even women, even Shudras, will 
recognize me and find me in their hearts. So this system of recognition of the where to go becomes less important, more important what you as a soul need for your self-development. And that is, uh, I think, uh, an approximate answer to your question, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. I have one more question from my friend. Hold on. Yes. Hello, sir. Thank you for taking my call. And uh, very interesting is uh, I, uh, that in terms of soul, soul is basically at, at the, like a subtle sublime uh, within us, which is not part of the body. But at the same time, when we sleep, when we dream, when we do our uh, way of purifying ourselves, we do have a certain soul has sublime certain consciousness. But the, as you said, like, you know, it's almost like we try to live every day death. The only difference is the soul has not left the body, but the soul has very subtleness where all the consciousness in a pure form mm -hmm. able to function in a very utmost subtle fashion. And uh, so my thing is death is a constant movement happening every day but only thing is just because there's a fine connection between the subtle connection between the soul and the body which is not detached but the detachment is so subtle so when the consciousness becomes very pure that becomes very subtle it helps us to work in a very efficient way around us without suffering but when it detaches completely away from the body and it's a hard as a practitioner how to do the soul, which works in a very subtleness with the zero consciousness, zero distractions and everything. And there's a fine line. So that's why it's kind of wondering how people could tell, because it almost my prayer. Every time I go to bed, I pray, God, God, take me to heaven. Guess what? Please make sure you bring me back tomorrow. I don't want to miss the flight. Even if it is delayed, I want to come back. There is a certain amount of subtle uh, soul and consciousness which work which is not in my consciousness, but with, through meditation process, I do have a certain kind of, I call them as a, uh, like a kite and a thread. My soul is connected to my body through my awareness, which helps me when I'm aware, when I go to bed, that is not there. So there's a fine line between consciousness working very effectively and going to bed where consciousness where the soul and the body is not in our consciousness because we can't use the component of consciousness just like in sleep and in the death. But I can do it when I'm aware. The very interesting thing is where cortical and subcortical work in a very different way. Subcortical work in the sleep pattern where my cortex is not aware. When I'm aware, my cortex is aware, but my subconsciousness, I can control it through my subcortical structures. But when I am die, I miss both the component. So it's going to be irreversible death. My interesting thing is, every day is a death, but only thing is your soul has not detached from the body, but I use that little kite as my sub sublime consciousness to hold on to that consciousness and body connected. That That is something which I always, that's my, every day my prayer is, God take me to heaven, but make sure you don't forget to bring me back. Even if you miss a flight, make sure you have a, I wouldn't mind sitting in the plane to come back and delay it because I, it's such a beautiful thing when the awareness and the body works in a very subtle way where you don't have to worry about suffering because the very part of suffering for me is where my awareness has done very, not done very effective way. That's what I thought, you know. So if you could help me out, see how, you know, so you can uh, say just a thought. <laughs> it's a very nice thought. Um, uh, truly speaking, you, you uh, hit the very important point. I do not know whether it comes from uh, science or um, your practice or that the relation of the soul and the body is unique. And um, the body, as mother says, when the cells fall apart, when uh, there is no consciousness holding them, that means the decision of the soul to depart was taking place. So that thread of the kite is cut. Yes, the kite is free to fly. And so there is no more of the one who holds that body in, uh, that, um, in the physical. So basically what happens is that our physicality, our this physical purusha, is a prototype of the future embodiment of the divine. Yeah? 
And because of that, all these things are so important in the physical. Only in the physical, they, the evolution takes place, the learning takes place, the awareness has to come to the physical. That's the sacrifice of the Veda. Yes. The, 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 our life is the sacrifice. Our life is the Holocaust of the Divine Mother. Yes. So we are here to do this work, to bring more and more awareness into the body. Body is the future. Body is the embodiment of the soul. Soul and body are related. They are, they have that psychic nature. Yes. Our, our earth is of psychic nature, Mother says. It is the psychic being of the universe. It is there only on earth that things can change and grow in consciousness. So when we gain this physical body, and she says even that even great gods, Rakshasas, Asuras, if they want to change in consciousness because they are typal beings, they have to take a physical body on earth. They have to be born in the human form in order to evolve, you know, in order to change. So the body plays a very unique role in connection to the soul. Uh, there is something which is totally mysterious about our bodies. <laughs> yes. Uh, HP, uh, it is somebody from your side wants to say something. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, that was him. Yeah, He's a doctor. Him. He's a medical doctor that asks questions. Right, right. We don't see you or him, so we do not know who is raising the hand. Well, well, Vladimir, are... I just... Um, oh. oh, you're driving. Yeah, I'm moving. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. You know, I was thinking, uh, Vladimir, as you were talking there about this, um, what did you call it, a concentration or a, or what happens at the cell level is a de decentralization of consciousness. What was the word that was yes, used? De decentralization, decentralization. Yes. It, it seemed to me perhaps that uh, this relationship between the soul and the uh, physical body and the physical cells is the soul, when embodied, becomes the center of gravity for that body. Mm -hmm. And that's what's holding it. Gravity is holding it. And the minute the soul decides to leave, there is no mm -hmm. longer any center of gravity. And so this consciousness then falls apart or decentralized. So just, a, I mean, no way of <laughs> obviously mm -hmm. showing one way or the other, but just a, just a thought that came on, on how that process might happen. Um, and how that soul can be uh, our center of gravity. Yeah, yeah. thank you. That's a good okay. analogy, yes. Well, we thank uh, everyone for joining us on this very uh, first um, session. And uh, let me see, next week we are going to have a panel discussion with Don Solomon and Marco Macy on why the rising interest in near-death uh, experiences. And again, here in the U.S., we'll stay at 10 o'clock. But if you're joining us from India, instead of 7.30, it will be 8.30. But we thank you all again. And thank you, uh, Vladimir, very, very much thank for you. that enlightening talk. Yes. And thank you, Robin and HP, for joining us. Thank Namaste. You.